This week, we're in the Midlands, in a town whose name rings a bell for its famous school and for a game played around the world. We're in rugby. It was on the close here in rugby in 1823 that William Webb Ellis was playing an ordinary game of football. Now, the rules of the time said that you could catch the ball, but then you had to kick it. Now, young Webb Ellis caught the ball, but immediately ran with it to the opposition goal line. I say, steady on, young Ellis. Football games at the time were disorganised and densely populated affairs. Often the whole school joined in. And while Ellis's decision to run with the ball was an original touch, it wasn't the red card crime that it would be today. Money has a shot. Ellis's moment of inspiration had far-reaching effects, and the passions aroused by the Six Nations Championship and the World Cup are awesome to behold. Rugby school itself dates from 1567, but some of its most celebrated years are recalled in a famous book, Tom Brown's School Days. Thomas Hughes, a pupil himself, describes the school at the time of the headmaster, Dr. Thomas Arnold, who ran the school from the pulpit. He declared his mission to be, first, religious and moral principle, secondly, gentlemanly conduct, thirdly, intellectual ability. And you can add ladylike conduct to that list because today, rugby school caters for 760 students, boys, and girls. Rugby as a town has always supported the industry of the Midlands. From the arrival of the canals and railways to the modern motorway network, the secret of its prosperity has been location, location, location. Recently, a new museum opened here, which, like William Webb Ellis, has a dash of innovation. Instead of filling the displays with objects that they think are important, the museum staff asked local people for items from their own lives that they thought should be preserved. The result is a kind of open time capsule, providing a very intimate and interesting record of rugby's 20th century. I suppose it all comes under the heading of miscellaneous. Well, let's hope they've saved a few cherished belongings to show our experts. You find people to rugby and to the antiques road show. Our venue in rugby is the Ken Marriott Leisure Centre. It's been in the family for many years. It belonged to my grandmother, who bought it off someone who'd fallen on hard times. Right. And I watched her cleaning it many years, and then my mother had it and she cleaned it. Yes, yes. And then it came to, to us just before my mother died. Lovely. Well, what's, what's so nice, of course, is that you haven't altered it into a, into a modern lamp, which is lovely. You've got all, the, all the, uh, the original old pieces here, which I think is really super. It's very, very good to see. You, you, do you use, I mean, do you ever use it at all? Yes, we do. We have it in our lounge. Yes. But my husband's the one who's taken part in a, a part conversion. Well, I, I made quite sure I didn't do anything basic to it. I right. simply found an old tobacco tin, put it on top of a burner here yeah. with a lamp holder and a bulb, and it's got a modern shade on it, right. and it's used every and day. And then you, say you can use it every day? Every yes. Day. But it's still in its uh, actually original condition, yes, which, is, which is marvellous. Elkington and Company of Birmingham's patented electroplating in about 1840 and they had a huge premises in Birmingham and they're the only people who ever used a date letter system for electroplate. It's marked down here Elkington and Company and this is the date letter L which you can see there which is the Elkington plate date letter for 1872. So it's, it's pure, pure 18th century revival, revivalist right. work. Thank and you. It's a, it's a, it is a lovely thing. If this wonderful baluster here with the scroll is typical sort of Anglo-French work of the 1740s and 50s. Have you ever had it valued? No, we've never been able to get it valued. I did take it to one of the big companies in yep. Birmingham, yep. and they said they couldn't value it because they'd never seen anything like it come yeah. up at auction. So well, it's been agree. difficult for insurance purposes. I rather agree, yes. yes. We yes. both love it, You both we? love it, yes. yes. There's, no, there's no argument about it. Absolutely oh, well, not. We'd, no. never, we'd never sell it unless no. it was short of a meal. Good, <laughs> excellent. I think that it's quite difficult. I really do. I, I, I would have put about... Two and a half to three thousand pounds on it. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's a wonderful object. I mean, the lovely thing is the plating is in such stunning condition. Don't actually use it at all. I, I 
it stands in my bedroom where I can see it all the time. It's an ornament? Hmm, yeah. Is it a family piece or what? No, it's not. No, I, I bought it at an auction earlier on this year in the village. Yeah. Which is basically for village hall funds whereby you get rid of things that you don't really want. Yes. Um, but are too good to throw away. And I couldn't believe that somebody would want to actually give it away. So it was a charity that auction? It? Yeah, basically. Somebody yeah. clearing out the attic. Mm. Well, uh, can I ask you what you paid for it? Um, 146. £146. Pounds. Do you know it's from China? Well, I guess so. Yeah. Other than that, I don't know a thing. And each of the panels is made in blue and white, porcelain, mounted within a partially lacquered wooden frame. And the subject matter is very, very traditional Chinese subject matter. Now, these scenes, I think, have been lifted by the porcelain painter from a current well-known Chinese book of fables. Now, the Chinese actually invented the thought bubble and the speech bubble. And I'd like to think that in this scene here, you've got a, a maiden standing with her fan stretched out in ecstasy as this other maiden is playing on the jin, which is a table instrument, a sort of lute. And she's saying, oh, you're playing this piece like a running fox. You know, she's got a little running fox coming out of a bubble, coming out of the top of her head. And this is, in fact, just about 110, 120 years old, made in the, I think, around the 1870s, 1890s period. You paid 146 pounds, mm -hmm. And I think it's probably worth somewhere in the region of maybe five to eight hundred pounds. Oh, good. Well, that puts you in a quandary. Maybe you have to top up the charitable <laughs> fund that it was in aid of. In here, uh, we've got the chess pieces and the drafts pieces, a pack of cards, a uh, little bit of pair of markers here with wonderful tartanware decoration on, which were probably made by the Mocklin factory in Scotland in the middle of the last century. Uh, if we close the lid for a moment, we can see that the box is made beautiful burr walnut with a nice little brass plaque with initials in the center. And who did it originally belong to? Well, it, was, it belonged to my two aunts. Yes. Um, but I don't, I don't know where they got it from. The initials right. I don't think are anything to do with them. Well, as far as the date goes, we're looking at about 1850, 1860. And of course, if we put it in its social context then, certainly no computers, no television, no telephone, no radio. So in the evenings, they tended to have things like musical soirees and were great games players. And it's all original and it's beautifully complete. I see we've got a drawer at the bottom. See whether we can open that. Ah, oh, wonderful. Table croquet. Yes, yes. Do you play it on the table or on the on carpet? The, on the floor. On the, on the carpet. Floor. Yes. This yeah. is our favourite. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a great game. Let's get out one of the hoops. So, how much space do you need to set it up? Well, we've got a space about yeah. how big? About 10 foot square. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. And how many of you played at the same time? Usually only two at once. Yeah, I mean, but it's got up to eight, I think. It says mm. about eight. How many and here you have the markers. And a fiercely competitive, I would think. Well, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Terrific. OK. I would think for insurance purposes on a box like this, you're probably looking at 15 to 1,800 pounds. Gosh, as much as that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Would be highly collectible. Yeah. But keep it in the family and enjoy playing the games. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot. The thing that I particularly appreciate about it is that it's from Liverpool and it's from Penny Lane. Yes. I purchased it from a chap who had worked for the post office and lived in Merseyside. And, uh, there was a dispersal sale, I guess, at some point. It was something that he didn't have room for any longer. Oh, very good. Well, of course, I'm humming the song Penny Lane in my mind now. You probably are as well. Mm -hmm. But Penny Lane was an incredibly important route very important road to the Beatles right. because Paul McCartney every school day would get on a number 86 bus and go down Penny Lane. I didn't know that. Penny Lane was where a lot of the bus routes actually converged. When it comes to value there are probably two different values. I mean on the one hand you have the value of the post box. May I be very rude and ask you what you paid for it? I, I paid £150 going rate for a post box, probably right. worth a bit, just a bit more than that now, maybe, maybe a couple of hundred. But then on the other hand, you have these mad, keen, wonderful yes. Beatle fans who, for a, a, a bit of a symbol like this, 
from old Penny Lane may be prepared to pay three, four times as much. So where do you put the value? Tricky, perhaps, but I'm, I'm, I'm not planning to part with it. Good. Well, I'm very pleased that you brought it in. Derek Williams, it's by, who was exhibiting in the uh, late 19th century uh, and died in, in, in 1936. Uh, what is so nice is that this pattern frame is a absolutely belongs to that period. It's what we call running leaf and berry. And we can see how it's got two slips and the glass is on top of the slip, which has kept it in perfect condition. And, and you just bought it in the sale, or what, what, how did no, you come it? No, it was um, given to me by my mother, who inherited from her sister in about 76. So it's a long well, family yeah, history. Yeah. I mean, this artist trained in the 1880s, both in Belgium and Paris. And this is a view of Venice. But he hasn't painted on the spot. He's been to Venice many times, but I'm sure he's painted in the studio. And this is exactly the sort of mood of painting that captures the market today. Light touch impressionist painting. And therefore, the value of this little panel would be seven or eight thousand pounds. Pretty hard. Classic Satsuma type, a chalky, straw-coloured body covered in a transparent glaze, very finely crackled, and in this case, covered with scenes of samurai. Quite good painting, dates probably about 1920, 1925, thereabouts. This actually belongs exactly to the same Satsuma family. There's that chalky, pale, straw-coloured body with a finely crackled glaze. But the difference is that the painting on here is not actually figural painting, it's flower painting. It's a style that you can actually trace right back into the late 17th and early 18th century. It's very, very stylized. You've got chrysanthemum, blue, red, blue again with petals, beautiful turquoise green petals, these luscious gold chrysanthemums, and then suddenly space. Suddenly there's actually somewhere for the eye to relax. Yeah. Which one do you prefer? I think I prefer that one. You do? Yeah. yeah, that one looks more impressive, but the colours are far more outstanding on the smaller bars. Yeah, fewer colours, actually. Yeah. Well, that one is what I call the lamp-based material. Yeah. And you could probably put 100 to 150 pounds on that. This one, well, it's more likely to be somewhere between two and 4,000 pounds. Oh, you chose the right one. <laughs> Love way. When I first bought it, it was covered in curtain lining. And when I took it off, I seen this fabric underneath, and I thought it would look rather nice than in that, in the original, if right. I could get it. This, are you going to do this yourself, then? Yes. What a brave person you are. <laughs> Gosh, what a thing to take on, a Chesterfield settee with all this, this deep button upholstery. Is it... Well, it's a bit of a hobby. But I love to look at the old material here. I mean, it's just become incredibly delicate, hasn't it, and very thin. Yes. This wonderful, almost gothic shape, uh, which I suppose is the original upholstery. It's... And they started making these around, let's say, the middle of the 19th century. But this is probably towards the end of the century. It reminds me of home because my father and grandfather, their workshops, were making sofas, not Chesterfields, with this type of uh, action to lower the end here. But what I remember in my childhood, that I was never allowed to bounce on these. Are you allowed to? No. Not allowed to bounce on these at all, I hope not, because they're very, very delicate mechanisms. Pull it up a little bit. Oh, yes. Well, that's wonderful. But what is so extraordinary is not only have we got the working mechanism but the, but with the maker's name. Now this is what the patent name and you've got what, this, is that the patent details? I've got the got patent there? details on it right. but I couldn't find anything out about the maker at all. If I might have a look, this is Cornelius Vincent Smith of the Vincent Works. So a modest chap, he called the, the works after his own middle name of Osnaburg Street in London. That's in, in sort of I think the Tottenham Court Road area which is where all the big furniture makers were. And this is wonderful isn't it? When you see this I mean we just, I can imagine almost as a carpenter making that. I just find it fascinating from my childhood that somebody to know now, at long last, who patented this idea. Did you buy this a long time ago? No, only this year. How much did you pay, did you pay my ask? 50 pounds. 50 pounds? Yes. If that was reupholstered in, in your material, as professionally as you're going to do it, 
it's going to be £2,000 in a shop. When you've got here an historical piece of furniture. It's been my family, my mother and father, uh, for as far as I know, as long as I know. I mean, uh, 60, 70 years. 70 years, yes. Before the war. Yes. But I always remember it in the front room. Well, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful view, isn't it? It, so is. it, was, um, it is. It's fantastic colour. And um, all the busy life of Naples, That's um, what we which like seems about so it. exciting. But um, it's painted in gouache, yes. kind of body colour. Yes. But this kind of beautiful scene with the beautiful sky and the lovely is somewhat spoilt by uh, some yes. damage here. Now, what's yes. the story behind that? The story behind that is that we always used to hang it at home in the front room. And in those days, you only ever used the front room on a Sunday or Christmas. Right. And, of course, you got no central eating in them days. And probably the fire was probably lit on a Sunday or maybe not, but always at Christmas. And, of course, that's how it's got the damp from the wall. These vertical lines, in yes. fact, are where the original pine backboards were. And, of course, they were not a solid piece. Yes. They were actually in pieces. And what actually happened was that uh, impurities were drawn in through the circulation of air and over time, yes. through from the outside. Wow. And this, obviously, is not only is, is dirt, but the damp came in as well and has affected an area here. Yes. It's a great pity, isn't yeah, it? it? Because is. it, affects it, it, is. It, affects it, it affects its value. To be honest, when one looks at it from really quite a short distance, it yeah. looks absolutely marvellous. It does, until you get close up to it. Yes. This, I believe, was painted in the first part of the 19th century. And to be honest, they were kind of factories of artists churning these things out for the visitors and the tourists to uh, Naples. Oh, I see, And yes. probably for 100 and 150 years, it's quite likely that the same families yes. would teach their sons and daughters to produce views for Italy. I see, yes. If it had been in very, very con condition, yes, of course. one could have said that it was probably as much as, you know, £3,000. Really? But I think, unfortunately, with the damage, we probably have to halve that and say £1,500. That's very good. Very pleased. Good. Yes, very pleased well, thank you very much you. indeed. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Well, we found it in my aunt's effects when we cleared the house when uh -huh. she died, and... Uh, that was a nice surprise. Yes, it was. <laughs> but it's just very pretty, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sort of yes. Christmassy. Yes. Yeah, the little red robin. Well, it's a technique that was very popular around the 1870s and onwards, mm -hmm. and they're known as Essex crystals. Yes. And it's actually something that's very, very difficult to do, but because what it is is a semi-sphere of rock crystal, and they carve it from behind, like an intaglio. Mm -hmm. Very deep, because when you look at it sideways, it, it comes quite a long way yeah. into, in fact, that... It's actually three-dimensional, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is. And having carved it beautifully, they then paint it with a tiny, tiny little brush, so that the, the colour that you see goes on first, and then they put the other colours on behind mm -hmm. it. And then it's usually backed by a little sheet of mother of pearl to give that sort of reflection through it and provide a good background. And not only is it a lovely crystal, but this particular one's in this beautiful mount with a sort of entrelac of gold work going all the way around. And engraved on the back, a little inscription and a date. And it says WM to LWM 2512... 1875, so it was a Christmas present. Yes. Indeed, in 1875, so how appropriate. And do you know who the, the M's were? No, not really. That's something we've got to investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do know that one of the family names name was uh, Mariage. It's such a nice subject and it's such good condition and such a nice mount that I think this should be insured for something in the region of £3,000. Oh, that is a shock. Yes. <laughs> Well, a nice one, I hope. Yeah, very, very nice. nice. <laughs> That's wonderful, yeah. Well, this looks just the sort of thing that any young girl would want if she was going to set off in a career in business. Now, were you this young girl? I was indeed. And when did you get it? Oh, I think I was about five years old. And it was a Christmas present. And it cost the princely sum of six and sixpence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was led to believe I was a very fortunate child to have such an expensive present. Right. And my friend, who was my arch-rival, 
somewhat diminished my pleasure because she had a bigger one which cost 10 shillings. Oh, so. oh maddening. <laughs> so here we're looking at a little typewriter made in uh, England, made in New York and um, dating from the mid-1930s. It's got the sort of ring index mechanism here. You'd select your letter, a bit like one of those labelling machines. That's You'd right. select your letter, press it down and type your letter. An extremely arduous and time-consuming way. And very hard on the finger. <laughs> very hard on the finger. Now, did it put you off typing or did you go into a career in the secretarial no, it, didn't, it didn't put me off. And, and almost by default, I finished up as secretary to a company chairman. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was a good in six and six investment. You know, Could it have been. It started yes. you on your career. Could very have been. good. Very yes. good. If we're looking at value, we'd be talking about something around perhaps three hundred pounds. Goodness, because, because it's in its box, so a good six and six investment, My I would say. Goodness me, you know, it's nearly gone to the jumble sale before now. <laughs> well, well done, well done for looking after it. Thanks for bringing it in. Thank you very much. So it's actually quite a nice nineteen forties handbag, which you gave ten pounds for at a car boot sale. Right. But underneath all of this, it's actually got a little bit of a secret. And that is, if we open the drawer, inside it's got a gas mask, which is really the ultimate accessory, because you actually had to carry around, it was compulsory to carry around gas masks in the last war. So I think it's so unusual that it's, it's got to be £50 instead, and a great little secret. Well, I'm delighted to see this uh, little collection of uh, suffragette material. Um, at the same time, I must say that it is all rather gruesome. <laughs> I mean, this letter here from the governor of Holloway Prison, Alice Lee, this is about Alice Lee. I regret I have to return you the enclosed letter as the above is not entitled to receive letters or visits. I have, however, given your message about, um, about bail and so on and so forth, signed by the governor. It is rather, rather chilling that their mail yeah. was sent back like that. Absolutely. Who was Alice Lee? Alice, she, was, she was part of our family um, on my uh, grandfather's side. Eliza Lee was his mother, and uh, that was a, a daughter of yes. South yes. I must sister. say, I'm sure I should know her name, because obviously she was up there yeah. with the Pankhursts and all yeah. the... Chained to the railing. Chained to the railings <laughs> and all the rest of it. Yeah. And we've got souvenirs of the official programme, Women's Sunday, uh, uh, women's suffrage, photographs, um, obviously loads of cuttings and all that sort of thing, but a couple of what I have to say again, I mean they're very moving letters yeah, in absolutely. many ways. Now this letter was written by her, yeah. Alice Lee, from prison. That's right. And I just picked out one paragraph here which I'm going to read because I think it's terrible. Anyone who stops walking having exercise is immediately ordered to go back to her cell. Hence all those in delicate health and who in consequence needed to be needed the fresh air most were constantly deprived of it and i assume this letter she must have written in her cell but probably it yep. wasn't delivered i suspect i doubt it very much and it got past them well it's a very fine very fine very moving letter absolutely full of detail there but i think the piece of resistance if we're going to call <laughs> it that is this little piece of lavatory paper <laughs> And this letter actually did get out of Holloway Prison. Yep. Now, this is not by uh, her. This, this one is signed by Edith Law. Yep. Do we know who she was? Edith Law, again, was part of the family. So you've got your, 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 yeah. a family of feisty women. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, it's, it starts, this is, this is quite remarkable. It says, be wary and discreet. Dear friend who gets these, presumably she sent out more than one, yeah. please do your best to post these for me, and I am your debtor for I. Please give my love to all good suffs, suffragettes. Tell Miss Pankhurst I am well and longing to be free, uh, to be doing once more. I shall be very, very grateful for this service. Mrs P and I, Mrs Pankhurst and I, get no visitors or letters, you know. Yours in bonds of love, honour and Holloway, Edith Law. And she presumably folded that up and tucked it out of the window Absolutely. and it got to somebody. On the other hand, you also have this uh, um, little pamphlet. Beware, a warning to suffragists. And here is a, a suffragette, yeah. daintily clad in her prison costume, chains and all the rest of it, and written by a Miss, or probably Mrs, Cecily Hamilton, and it's very anti-suffragette. And if I may quote from the last, the moral at the end. Moral, 
Take warning of her awful end and don't to politics attend. Don't earn your living if you can. Have it earned for you by a man. Then sit at home from morn till night and cook and cook with all your might. It may be slow, but you can say it's just as slow as Holloway. <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful. Sick, 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 but I mean, absolutely tremendous. And yeah. very nice to see this splendid little collection. Have you thought of a value? No idea. Well, I think it's very exciting. I think properly catalogued, we could certainly get a thousand pounds for it. Right. Amazing. Oh, it's a wonderful piece of history, and thank you so much for bringing it in. Pleasure. I thought it was Indian or Persian by the, the decoration on the stock and the sort of very long barrel, the thick rifling, but I was very puzzled with what it said on the top. Obviously, guard corps means what it says, but the rest of it, I'm a bit... Um, Amused. <laughs> well, well, so am I. I've tried to read it, and I, I think that it's a mixture of what appears to be Greek, Greek. and f French, and also the word there is almost Germanic in sounding. Yeah. So I think that what has happened is that a native maker has seen a good quality European firearm that right. said Garde du Corps or something, like perhaps a, a French, like French, French yeah, musket, yeah, yeah. and has tried to copy it. Right, yes. And then the plot thickens. You said Persian. Yeah. I would have said a butt like that just absolutely shouts Turkish or the Balkans. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Particularly with that uh, rather nice bone inlay. Right. And then we go to the lock, which is very obviously English, English <laughs> and about 1790, something yes, like that, yes, yes. and signed D. Moore. Now, Daniel Moore II was a very prolific English gunmaker who was active for a very long time, from yep. 1746, dying in 1802. Yes. It, it, it is clearly far better than the average, because, first oh, yeah. of all, it's a rifle rather than That's just right, a, yeah, a, a, big, a smooth bore one. A big bore one. And a big well. one, as you say. And I think that it was put together in the 1820s, right. round about the sort of time of the oh, first yeah. strugglings for Greek independence with Lord Byron, oh, right, yes, and this yes. is just the sort of thing that would have been used out there. Have you given any thoughts as to what it might be Not worth? Not really. I, I swapped it for a clock movement um, about four years ago, and I think I had about £400, I think it owed me. Well, if it owes you, you know. £400, I suspect that you've made a pretty good profit on it, because yes. I think it's worth about £1,000. Oh, that's good, then. Now, this is a very, very glossy oak tabletop. Have you had it restored recently? Yes. Were you pleased with it when it came back? No. You weren't? No. It's too shiny, isn't it? It is, yes, much too shiny. Um, essentially, he's French polished it rather than wax polished it, and he's put a surface on that is totally unsympathetic to this style of country furniture. It's yeah. a great shame. Don't despair, because it is actually quite a decent mid-18th century gate leg table, but it can be brought back. It has to be completely stripped off and the whole thing started again. Bite the bullet and ultimately, when it's all done, it's worth the best part of a couple of thousand pounds. So it's worth doing. Yes. And Christopher, I've come across this uh, sort of family heirloom, which I think is very pretty. Is it a, a piece of furniture or, or what do you call it? It's uh, known as Vienna enamel. It's the centre of making these type of little boxes or even whole pieces of furniture. I mean, I've seen cabinets on stands, bureaus, bureau cabinets made with this, with plaques of this Vienna enamel. Uh, but we, we always say Vienna, but in fact it could easily be southern France, Bohemia, but the centre was known as Vienna. They're always called Vienna enamel. Very pretty, isn't it? Is it unusual? Is it rare? It's an unusual size. Rare, reasonably rare. In terms of value, yes. I mean, it's quite, quite sought after, really. Very collected. Something I've always dreamed of asking. What is it worth? <laughs> I would say eight to twelve hundred pounds at auction, but cleaned up a little bit, possibly in a jeweller's shop, getting on for two thousand pounds. Very nice. I have pleasure in returning the LP here with duly signed by the Rolling Stones. We hope that the raffle will be a great success and wish you lots of luck with your efforts. Now, what's all this about? Well, I won the raffle. And what was the raffle for? Well, it, it was in aid of the, uh, the Rag Queen Ball, which was the culmination of, of a week's work by the BTH apprentices. Who well, annually, here in rugby? Here in rugby. Oh, right. And they used to do this every year. Well, you lucky chap. I think so. <laughs> here we've got the Rolling Stones, but the best bit, of course, is on the back with all the signatures, including perhaps the most evocative of that period, Brian Jones. Mm. 
the album, 1964, their first album, um, with a letter from uh, Eric Easton, or from Eric Easton's company. Couldn't really be a better object and a better piece of provenance to go with it. And at rugby as well. And at rugby. I mean, it's, mm. a, it's a sort of delicious mixture, isn't it? Is it, is it a record that you played? I have played it, although mm. I haven't recently played it. But it used to get, I used to play it a lot. Right. I think, let's just have a quick look and see what the, the condition's like. Actually, it's not too bad. You must have been relatively careful when you were when I you suppose were as it. a 21-year-old, I must have been a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, fact, the fact that it survived at all. The cover is in good condition, a few little bends and so on. Uh, and the signatures are really very clear indeed. What did you pay for your raffle ticket at I that? I really can't remember, but it must have been a shilling, I would think, something no. like that. What's it going to be worth now? I would have thought something around five to eight hundred pounds. Mm. So, uh, yes, a good, a good investment for a shilling. Thanks very much okay. indeed for Thank bringing you. it in. This is a remarkable collection of uh, uh, things from the First World War. You've got drawings here, photographs, and these incredible, uh, incredibly atmospheric drawings. Um, and I have to read what this one is all about. This is quite extraordinary. It's entitled, A British Biplane Attack on a Bosch Balloon. Before making a grand attack, an aerial attack upon the enemy's observation balloons is made with the intention of blinding the eyes of their artillery. A favorite method of attack, providing the weather is favorable, is to approach the balloons above the clouds and when over the target to swoop through and fire incendiary bullets into the envelope, which contains a highly inflammable gas called hydrogen. And there it is, coming out of the clouds, and these poor two, well, two Bosch in, the, in there, and this other one here, which I think is also uh, very exciting as well. Um, again, the notes on the back of the picture. A Bosch plane came over the other day and fairly went for a balloon, so the occupant quitted and jumped in his parachute. Thereupon the Bosch circled round him and potted at him, luckily not hitting him. Well, finally, the parachute ended up on top of some hop poles quite safely. And then this wonderful comment at the end of here, quite amusing to watch. Yes, that's right. And this other one here, which I think is so exciting, which is um, people up in a balloon actually making maps. And I noticed the name here, Bernard Hugh. Tell me about Bernard Hugh. Well, Bernard Hugh was my mother's first husband, and uh, he was a balloon sergeant, and uh, he went to the First World War, and uh, he was taken up in a balloon, and he had to draw the enemy lines and note where their fire was coming from, and then the balloon would be taken down, and they would map the positions, I suppose it's artillery fire and things like that, isn't yes, it, yes. Uh, to try and get rid of the enemy guns. Well, that's incredible. Um, it must have been one of the most dangerous jobs during the war. This is a view from the balloon, a bird's eye uh, view of modern artillery battle at the Somme Front 1916. And really, it's, 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 it's a beautiful view in, in some senses, but it's an absolute horror. There's all bombs exploding around here. And finally, last but by no means least, is the man himself holding hands in Richmond Park. Is that with your, is that with your mother? It is. It's, it's your mother. mother. Yeah. Good yeah. Friday, 1923. Tell me, was he ever gassed? I mean... Yes. Um, there was a lot of gas around. He was mustard gassed. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he went into, I suppose, a field hospital. And whilst he was in there, I think he had a very good sense of humour. And he liked to draw cartoons. Which is what this one is all about, isn't it? Um, and this one, rather charmingly, has Princess Victoria's autograph signed there, Victoria. Well, royalty don't sign autograph books, you know, so that's quite a rare thing. Who was Princess Victoria, Princess please? Victoria, well, she was the daughter of... Um, Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. Obviously, by this time, George V was on the throne. She was obviously a nurse during the during the, oh, uh, the, the the war. I mean, she didn't just go there to visit. She actually went there to work as well. I like some of these. <laughs> well, I think they're, they're 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 wonderful, aren't they? They're almost Bruce Byrne's father, really, aren't they? If you knows of a better hole, go to it or something like that. But he was obviously a very good cartoonist. Well, Did I'm he have told actually that he, he went on to be cartoonist for the Daily Mail? Yes. It's ridiculous to try and put a value on this uh, this collection. I mean, it is so 
invaluable, really, to see this sort of material. This is the sort of material that should be in a museum. What would we do for insurance value? Because we have seven of these pictures of this size flying around our dining room. Well, yes, seven of those. I think, from an insurance point of view, we would have to say 10 or 15,000 pounds and possibly more. I mean, the excitement of this sort of material is that it is so rare. Where does it live in your house? In, in the hall. I in have it as an umbrella stand. Do you have particularly ferocious umbrellas and walking sticks? No, no, I don't. They're quite good. Well, course, I didn't do the damage. The reason I ask, of course, is because if we turn it round, we see the awful damage here. Um, and this is going to make quite a big difference yeah. in terms of giving you a valuation. Yeah. Because it, it's a handsome and a rare piece. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's typical of high Victorian eclecticism. Um, eclecticism meaning that the Victorian sort of gathered influences from all over the world and crammed them all in together. You end up with a sort of neoclassical, almost chinese object yes, here. Yes, I, I mean, thought these. Yeah, well, those, those I would say, are much more sort of Italian Renaissance really? in style. What about this, this element down here? This is very much Chinese. This is a lotus pod, a lotus oh, flower. Right. And really, the period is determined by all of these elements coming together. It'll be somewhere in the 1870s. Yes. Now, I'm pretty sure I know which factory this is, but I'm going to turn it upside down. Oh, it's yeah. a heavy object. It is. Right. Let's it's just put it down here. And the mark will hopefully be around here somewhere. There it is. Yeah, sure enough, it's by the great Staffordshire Majolica factory, Minton's. Yes. And this little mark here, that's a date code, which translates for somewhere in the 1870s, I think 1873. Oh, gosh. My goodness, it's so everything. Would there be a lot of them, or would they...? You know... It's a terrifically complicated shape to make. Yes. I mean, if you think that uh, the jar is made in two halves, you can actually see the seam on, on the sides okay. here, yeah? Uh, so that's slip cast in two moulds, oh. which would then be assembled. And I suspect, to answer your question, how, are, are, are these common? No, they're not. Oh, right. I think the reason is because of the incredibly elaborate construction technique. Yes. But the tragedy is, as we've seen, the damage here and the hole in the base. Uh, for 40 years, Joe's father had this vase up in Manchester. And it used and to live it used outside. To put in it. With hydrangeas, it lived outside. Yes, outside. That's a mark. So yeah, it wasn't a damaged by sticks then. What was, what, no, no. What, what caused no. the damage? Well, according to uh, who you call him, Granddad, George's father, it was damaged in the blitz. So it's bomb damage. It was bomb damage, well, and you know, he said, know "Throw it away." And he said, "Oh, can I have it for my hydrangeas?" And he said, "Yes." Yeah. And he kept it. My own advice would be, get a little bit of restoration done. You will still have a stick stand worth somewhere in the region of three to five thousand pounds. Mm. Very nice. It's quite good, that, isn't it? It's, it's, very, very hard. No, we didn't it's also about 150 pounds in this condition. It's from Scotland. I bought in a second-hand shop about 50 years ago. It's my stepfather's painting. Well, the artist, uh, Theodore Gerard, is Belgian. Uh, and this uh, is clearly signed and dated um, 18... 64. Now, when we look at the quality, uh, we can see that it is beautifully painted. Um, it could be finer. 19th century painting, the great industrial revolution, is about craftsmanship. The paints have changed. Here, they're no longer grinding their own paints. They're using mass manufactured paints which come out of tubes, etc. The other thing is that there, were, there was no cinema in the 19th century. And, if you, and, and yet you can see the today's cinema paralleled in 19th century paintings. If this was a film today, it would one of those heart-tugging American films which was just catching you, catching your emotions, and that's exactly what this sort of picture does. And then these pictures have gone from great popularity when they were painted to abhorrent objects after the First World War. And then with... Today, we've gone through several new industrial ages where new money has been made, especially in America, but all over Europe, and these pictures have become very popular again. I don't know whether you would ever thought about a price. We haven't really. 
we haven't. It's just always been there and it's never really been valued or looked at before. You know? Well, this artist doesn't turn up very often, so there isn't really much of a market. And I would say that a reasonable sort of value for this picture would be £15,000. But it could be as much as 20, 25,000 because it is a very beautiful painting. That's nice. As far as I know, he was bought by my aunt and uncle when they were on their honeymoon. And I don't know where they went on the honeymoon, but it, uh, it was in the early 50s. And then as a little girl, I often used to go and stay with them. And he was on the, on the ledge. And every night when I went to bed there, my aunt said, Jumping Thunder will guard you tonight, so you will be safe. All right. And that was my introduction to him. And sadly, my aunt and uncle died some years ago, and Jumping Thunder came to me. All right. Have you ever done any finding out as to exactly who made him? Well, I got a book, yes. a very thick book, from a library, and I sat down for about four hours, going through it, looking at all the marks, and I couldn't find it. OK. So basically, you've got the initials RP, mm -hmm. uh, back to front, if you yeah. will. And RP is for Rookwood Pottery. And Rookwood Pottery was in Cincinnati. And it was founded um, in, in 1890 by a lady called um, Maria Longworth Nichols. And Rookwood uh, went on to become the foremost American art pottery of its time. Now, there were two particular decorators working at Rookwood um, who were responsible for this type of decoration. Um, and their names were Edward T. Hurley and Matthew Daly. Now, there's no signature on this, so it's one or t'other. But the technique is very clever because you've almost got a three-dimensional effect here, haven't you? It's yeah. got almost, almost photographic. And the reason is that they've actually mixed, mixed the pigments with the glaze. So if you were to run your finger over it, it's very, very fine, but it's very gently raised, mm -hmm. and it's very, very effective. Um, now, as with anything um, American and 19th century and quality, um, there is a, a market. Um, I can see from the look in your eyes, it doesn't matter what I'm going to say, does it? No. But um, I would go home and I would actually make sure that my insurance cover on your vase uh, was um, at least £5,000. What? You've been looked over by, um, by a guardian Indian in, in every uh, sense of the word, haven't you? Well, with the reception area deserted, it's time to blow the whistle on this particular rugby tour. But with so many things proudly on display, it would be quite wrong of us to say goodbye without mentioning the name of Sir Frank Whittle, the pioneer of the jet engine, who did so much of his design work here at Brownsover Hall, which is now, incidentally, a hotel. We shall be returning there a little later to drink a toast to his memory. And don't forget, if you want to find details of all the items we've seen today and on past roadshows, you can visit our website. Until next week, from rugby, goodbye. <laughs>